from around the globe, it's theCUBE, with digital coverage of Ansible Fest 2020, brought to you by Red Hat. Hello, welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of Ansible Fest 2020. This is theCUBE, CUBE Virtual. I'm your host, John Furrier with theCUBE in SiliconANGLE. Two great guests here, two engineers and architects. Michael McCarthy, who's an architect, uh, at Delivery Engineering, who's giving a talk with GameSys and Jorgen Reck, who's a technical architect for the platform engineering team at GameSys. Gentlemen, welcome uh, to theCUBE. Thanks for coming on. Hello, nice to see you. Coming in from London, coming in from Malta. You guys are doing a lot of engineering. You're a customer of Ansible. Want to get into some of the cool things you're doing. Obviously Kubernetes automation, you know, platform engineering. This is what everyone's working on right now that's going to be positioned for the future. Uh, before we get started though, tell me a little bit about what GameSys does and you guys' role. Michael, we'll start with you. Uh, sure, um, so we're a, we're a gaming operator. Um, we run um, multiple um, bingo-led and casino-led gaming websites. Some of them are B2B, some are B2C. I think we've been doing it now for probably 14 or 15 years at least. Um, I've been there for 12 and a half of those. So uh, we essentially um, uh, run gaming websites where people come and play their favorite games. And what's your role there? What do you do? Uh, so I'm I'm in the operations side of things. I, I used to be a developer for 12 or so years. Um, we we make sure that everything's kind of up and running. We, we keep the systems running. Um, my team in particular focuses on the speed of delivery for developers and um, so we're constantly looking at you know how long is it taken to to get things in front of customers can we make it faster can we make it easier um you know can we put cool stuff out there quicker so it's a kind of platformy type role that i do and i enjoy it a lot so that's good you're your platform engineering that sounds uh deep yes which is your role <laughs> Well, I've been with GameSys also for eight and a half years now. I hold the position of technical architect at the moment within this platform engineering group, which is mostly tasked with all things ops related. I am responsible for designing, implementing, and validating strategies for continuous deployment, whilst always ensuring high availability on both production and pre-production systems. I'm also responsible for the design and implementation of automated dynamic environments um, uh, to support the needs of the development teams and also collaborating with other architects, especially those on the development floors, in order to optimize the deployment and operational strategies for both existing and new types of services alike. Awesome, thanks for sharing that, good good context. Well, I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that when you talk about gaming, it's uptime and high availability is critical. You know, having people um, being to log in, you got to have the right data strategies. I mean, you can't be down, right? <laughs> it's it's mm -hmm. a critical app. Right. People are they're not going to enjoy it if they're not on it. So I, I can see how scale is huge. Can you guys talk about how Ansible fits in? Because automation has been the theme here. You guys have been having a journey with automation. What's been your automation solution with Ansible? I'll go, Michael. Yeah. So basically back in July, 2014, we started to look at Ansible to replace those commonly used day-to-day -day bash scripts, which our ops team used to execute and which could lead to some human error. That was our main original goal of using Ansible at the time. At the time also our infrastructure looked considerably different, definitely much, much smaller than the current private private cloud footprint. Um, and as I said, as early adopters within the operations team, it was imperative for us to automate as much as possible those repetitive tasks which involved the execution of various scripts and were prone to human error. Um, since then, however, our Ansible usage evolved quickly. Um, uh, since 2014, we went through two major infrastructure overhauls and automation using Ansible was always at the heart of each of those overhauls. In fact, our latest private cloud, which is based on OpenStack, is completely built from the ground up using Ansible code. So this includes the provisioning of virtual machines, our entire networking stack, so switches, routers, firewall, 
DSDN, which OpenStack is built up on our internal DNS system. Basically, all you need to have a fully functional private cloud. Um, at GameSys, we also have some workloads running into different public clouds. And even in this case, we are running Ansible code to set up all the required infrastructure components. Again, since we were fairly new adopters at the time of this technology, we wrapped all of those Ansible code um, uh, using the original SDKs. However, now this evolved considerably and with enhancements of dedicated modules for each public cloud, we've made the code look much cleaner, readable, and error-proof. You made some great progress. Michael, you want to weigh in on this? Yeah. Any thoughts I, on Yeah, I think it's kind of, I mean, adding to what Jürgen said, I think it's kind of everywhere. So, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned high availability, you mentioned kind of uptime. Um, you, you know, imagine the, imagine the pe people that operate the the infra, the people who get called out and they're working 24 seven, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the things that they would do, the kind of run books they would use to, you know, restart something they're, they're Ansible as well. So it's the deployment scripts, it's the kind of scripts that keep things running. It's the stuff that spins up the, the environments, as Jürgen said, um, I've noticed a lot on the, uh, on the development side where, you know, we, we look at continuous delivery, people are running their own. Um, build servers, a lot of the scripting that people do, which you know you'd imagine might be done with sort of say bash. I think I've seen a lot of Ansible being used there amongst developers. Um, I guess you know it's it's got a it's got an easy learning curve. It's got all of those modules. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the scripting around around CD I think is Ansible. It plays quite nicely. Um, you know URI module and file modules and um, yeah, I, I, I think it's it's kind of everywhere i think it's quite once it gets in it's hard to, once you get something going good it's awesome yeah. automation again great success so it's been a big theme of ansible fest 2020 automation collections etc but the question i have for you guys as customers is how large of an it estate were you looking to automate and where was the most imperative uh, places to automate first the most imperative items we wanted to automate first as i said were those operational day-to-day -day tasks handled by our network operations team. Our estate is massive. So we are running our infrastructure across five different data centers around the world. Um, thousands of virtual machines, hundreds of network components. So we, we, deal, we deal with customers all around the world. So our point of presence is spread out around the world as well. And you can't really handle such kind of size without some sort of automation. And Ansible fit the bill perfectly in my opinion. And so your goal is to automate the entire landscape. Are you there now? Where are you on that progress? I would say we're at a very advanced stage in that process. Since 2014, we've made huge strides. All of our most recent private cloud setups as I said, have been built from the ground up using Ansible, and I would say yeah. a good 90% plus of our operational tasks are handled using some kind of Ansible playbook. Yeah, it makes total sense. Michael, you brought up the, um, the you start early and people, it spreads, those are my words, but you were essentially mm -hmm. saying that. Um, what kind of systems do people uh, tend to start with at Ansible? Um, and and what's, where's that first sticky moment where it lands and expands? And which teams jump on it first? Is it uh, the developers? Is it more the IT? Take us through some of how this all gets started and how it spreads. I think in the, the first time I remember using it was probably, I think 2014, 2015. And it was what Jürgen mentioned. I was on the dev side and we, we, wanted, a, we wanted a way to, to have consistency in how we deployed. We wanted to be able to deploy the exact same way, you know, into, into earlier environments, into dev environments as we did in, in staging and production. Um, and you know, someone kind of found Ansible, and then someone in operations kind of saw it, and they were happy with it, and and they felt comfortable using the kind of get, getting up to getting up to speed. Um, and and I think it was hard to know where it really started first, but you sort of looked around, and every team, yeah. every team kind of had it. So you know, who actually started? I'm not sure, but it's like it's, it's all all over the place. <laughs> <He did. laughs> um, yeah, and I, I think you know where where people start with it first it probably depends if you're on the, the the ops or the dev side i think on the dev side you know we're encouraging people to to own their own deployment playbooks you know you're you're responsible for the um 
you know, for, for the deployment of your system to production. I mean, obviously, you've, you've got the network operations, uh, the not group sort of doing it for you. But, um, you know, your first exposure is probably going to be, you know, writing a playbook to deploy your app, or maybe it's around some build tooling, um, spinning up your own build environment. That, that's something you'll be doing kind of with Ansible. And, um, you know, it's, it's especially around the deployment stuff, because, because everything's in, in Git, there's, there's that collaboration, which I, I you know, I, I never saw, obviously I saw, you know, people chatting over kind of Slack and Teams, but, but in terms of being able to sort of raise PRs, having developers raise PRs, having operations comment on them, the same the other way around, but that, that's been a massive change, which I think um, has, has come from using Ansible. The collaboration piece is huge. And I think it's one of those things early on, I've all the Ansible um, friends that I know that use it and customers and in the company, product was just good. It just word of mouth spreads it around. People are like, this is workable. Mm -hmm. It saves a lot of time and it's a pain point remover. It also enables some things to happen with now automation, but now it's mature, right? <laughs> so you're good. I got to ask you in the maturation of all this automation, you're talking about scale. You mentioned it. OpenStack, you guys got the private clouds, but people use it for public cloud. And obviously Red Hat has an angle on that. But when you think about the current modern state of the art today, you can't, go anywhere without talking about Kubernetes. Um, yep. Kubernetes has really emerged on the scene to manage these clusters, but yet it's just getting started. You have a lot of experience with Ansible and Kubernetes. Can you share your journey with Kubernetes and Ansible and what's your reaction to that? Yes, so uh, back in June, 2016, uh, Gamesys was developing a new gaming platform, which was to run on Kubernetes. Kubernetes at the time was fairly new to many at an enterprise level with only a handful of production systems online. So uh, we were tasked to, to assess how we're going to bring Kubernetes into production. So we first we identified the requirements to set up a production grade cluster. And given our experience with Ansible, we embarked on a journey to automate the, this, this installation process. Um, Again, using Ansible, this would ensure that all the required installation and configuration parameters, as Michael mentioned, were committed in Git. The code is shared with all the respective development teams for ease of collaboration and feedback. And uh, we decided to logically divide our code into two. And we said we we're going to have an installation code in order to provide Kubernetes as a service. So this basically installs Docker onto every worker node. It installs Kubelet, all the master plane components of Kubernetes. It installs Core DNS, the container storage interface, and a full-blown in-cluster monitoring stack. Then we also had our configuration code, which basically sets up namespaces, it labels nodes for specific uses, at certain security policies according to the cluster use case and creates all the required role-based access configurations. This need to split the code in two came about really with the growing adoption of Kubernetes because at the inception stage, we only had the one team which had a requirement to use Kubernetes. However, with various teams getting on board, each required their own flavor with their particular unique configurations. This is, of course, all managed quite easily through the use of different Ansible inventories. Um, and it's all integrated now within Ansible Tower with different unique job templates to install and configure the, the Kubernetes clusters. We started, as I said, with just one pre-production or staging cluster in 2016. Today, we manage 42 different Kubernetes clusters, including six which are in production. What problems? Uh, so as solve? I mentioned I mean, earlier, I got to ask you because Kubernetes certainly, when it came out, mm -hmm. I mean, I was a big fanboy of that. I was promoting Kubernetes from the beginning. I saw it as a really great opportunity to get to bring things together with containers. It turns out um, yep. that developers love it for that reason. What, you know, so getting your hands on is great, but as you moved it in, into yep. practice, what problems did it solve for you? So using Ansible definitely solved the problem of ensuring that all of our four to two clusters across all the different data centers are running the same configuration. So they're running the same version, they're running the same security policies, they're running the same namespace according to the type. Um, each team has a similar deployment token. Um, and 
it's very, very convenient to roll out changes and upgrades, especially when all of our code has been integrated with Ansible Tower through a simple, a simple user interface click. How's Ansible Tower uh, working for you? Is that, a, that going well? Ansible Tower. Uh, I would say so, yes. Uh, most of our code now is integrated with Ansible Tower. It's allowed us to also share some of the tasks with a wider group of people. Um, uh, within PEG, we are the guardians of the production environments, really. However, we share the responsibility of staging environments with the respective development teams who primarily use those environments. So as such, through the use of Ansible Tower, we've managed to also um, securely and consistently share the same way how they can install and upgrade these clusters themselves without our involvement. Thank you. Michael, you're giving a talk. It. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, mm -hmm. Sorry, no, no, go ahead. go ahead. Michael, you're giving a presentation breakout session at Ansible Fest. Can you give us a sneak peek yep. of uh, what you're going to talk about? Uh, yeah, sure. So we, I said we've been using Tower for a long time. Um, we've been using it since 2015, I think. Um, uh, that we've probably made some mistakes along the way, I guess, or, or we, we've learned a, a lot of stuff from from how we started then to now. Um, so what it does is it, it follows this sort of timeline of, you know, why, you know, how we started, why there was this big move to, you know, make an effort to put all of our deployment playbooks in Ansible. Um, you know, why why you would go to Tower over and above Ansible itself. Um, it talks about our early our early interactions with with quite an old version of Tower now, version version two. Um, you know, things that things that we struggled with. Then we saw version three came out. There was loads and loads of really good stuff in version three. Um, and it's really about kind of how we've how we use the new features, um, how it's worked out for us. It, it's kind of about what games us have done with Tower, but I think it's probably applicable to to everyone. You know, any, anyone that uses Tower, I think will you know, they'll, they'll probably come across the same things, you know, how do I, how do I scale it for multiple teams? How do I um, give teams the ownership to kind of own, own their own playbooks? How do I, how do I automate Tower itself? Um, so it, it talks about that. Um, it sort of checkpointing every few years about, you know, wh where we'd got to and, and, you know, what was going well and what was going less well. So, um, yeah. and, and a bit of a look forward to what's going to come next with Tower. So we, we, we you know, we're constantly keeping up to date and, We've, we've got a kind of roadmap for where we want to go. What's interesting about you guys is, you know, you think about look at OpenStack and then how cloud came on the scene and private cloud has emerged um, with hybrid and obviously public. You guys are right on the wave of all this large scale stuff and your gaming app really kind of highlights that. Um, and you've been through the paces with Ansible. So I guess my question, and you get a lot of scar tissue and you got success to show for it too, a lot of great stuff. What advice would you give people um, who are now getting on the new wave, the, the bigger wave that's coming, which is um, more users, more scale, more features, more automation, microservices are coming around the corner. Um, it's only going to get more scale. What advice would you give someone who's coming on board with Ansible for the first time? I, I think there, there was, you were talking before about um, Kubernetes and, and it was, so, so where we were, I, I think we'd got into containers kind of relatively early and, and, and we were deploying Docker. Um, and, and we had some pretty big kind of scary playbooks and, and they, you know, managed load balancers and, and, and deployed Docker containers. And, uh, and, and it was always interesting to think, you know, how, how is this all going to change when, when Kubernetes comes along? And I think that's been really smooth. I think the, the, there's some, there's a really nice, uh, Ansible module that's just called Kate's, um, and and I think it's really simple. Actually, it simplified a lot a lot of the playbooks. And I think the the technologies can coexist quite happily. You know, I, I don't think you you have to feel like Kubernetes is going to change all of the investment you've made into Ansible. Um, you know, you, you can you, even if you go down the route of of Kubernetes operators, you can write them in Ansible. So um, I, I still think it's a it's a very relevant tool, even even with Kubernetes being so kind of prevalent. Jürgen, what's your thoughts on uh, folks getting in now um, who want to jump so in and take I, advantage of the automation, all the cool stuff with Ansible? What would, advice would you give them? Yes, I, I would definitely recommend to look at their infrastructure setups as they would look at their code. So break it down into small 
manageable components. Start small, build your roles, make sure to build your roles properly for each of that small component. And then definitely look at Ansible Tower as a way to visualize and control the execution of your code. Make sure you're running it with the proper security policies, with the proper credentials, in order not, of course, to break anything which is at the production level. Michael McCarthy, Jürgen Reck, two great engineers at GameSys. Congratulations on your success and love to unpack yeah. the, uh, the infrastructure and the scale you have and certainly the automation, great success path. And uh, it's going to get easier. I mean, that's what everyone's saying. It's going gonna, it's gonna to get easier. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. I appreciate the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Take care. All right. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE here in Palo Alto, California. We're virtual. The Cube virtual for Ansible Fest 2020 virtual. Thank you for watching.